Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It's so good to have you back with us for our Wednesday night Bible study. We're excited about all the good things that the Lord has been doing, and it looks like things are going to change for the better. We hope so anyway. And uh, we want to bring you up to date, give you a little heads up, a little notification of what's going on and uh, what's happening in the possibility realm of getting things opened up. It looks like that we are going to be able to open back up for Mother's Day, May the 10th, here at the church. We'll have one service on May the 10th. And Governor Parson is uh, starting to the Reopen Missouri program. Uh, Show Me Open, I believe, is what he's calling it, or something to that effect. And he's going to do it in phases, going to open the state back up in phases. He's going to start phase one, which will start Monday, May the 4th, and go through May the 31st. At that time, he'll reevaluate and if everything is going good, if the case number for the virus is going down or holding steady, then he'll enter into phase two. But if it looks like we're having another upswing, then they'll take some other type of actions. So what we want to do today is we want to give you real quick, before we get into our message, we want to give you the guidelines that they have stated that's important for us as a church when it comes to reopening and getting everything going and everything under control. We want to remember, first of all, that everyone has to do social distancing. That's the key word in this whole process is social distancing. Uh, We have to stay six feet apart, and they are asking that when you come together in churches that you don't hug and that you don't shake hands and that you keep that social distancing apart. And if you're sick, please stay home. If you're sick, don't hesitate to stay home, and, uh, and we will understand that totally. And if you don't feel comfortable coming because of the situation, we understand that. Stay at home until you do feel comfortable uh, coming out to church, and and we'll understand that. So uh, nobody will have any problem with that if you're not comfortable yet. If you still want to be a little cautious and you want to stay home, if you've got a a physical condition that you think you might be a little more susceptible to uh, the situation and you might be a little more vulnerable then we totally understand that and we want you to be able to be comfortable when you do come to church so governor parson says that he'll have more guidelines for us throughout this week and i believe if my memory serves me correct that he says that he will be updating that on a daily basis that he will be giving us more guidelines so the way it stands right now is that we're going to open back up on mother's day may the 10th with social distancing practices in line. Be respectful of that. If somebody, uh, don't be offended by other people's social distancing. It's not that they don't like you, and it's not. It's just that they are trying to stay safe and trying to uh, go by this. We will not have Sunday school for the next few weeks. Uh, We've been to get apart for six weeks or so now, and we just want to come together as one as a body and worship and, and study the word of the Lord. We'll be doing some things different. Uh, as far as where we can go, what we can do, but let's just, let's just be mindful that we are in the midst of a crisis and we are doing our best to get this thing back to where it should be without any more problems. But we're glad you're with us this evening and we trust that you're having a great week. This evening we want to uh, go to the Word of the Lord for just a few minutes. We trust that the blessings of the Lord are making you rich and adding no sorrow to your life, that the Lord is good to us all of the time. We'd like to turn in the to the book of Hosea, one of my favorite books in the Bible, and I, I know it seems like I speak to that from there every once in a while, but it's, it's a book that is so rich uh, of blessings of the Lord and such lessons that are so viable to us and, and so good for us to be able to grasp a hold of and, and so good for us to, to learn and to grow in. And uh, the story of redemption, the story of how that the Lord loves us and how that He knows we mess up And even though we mess up, he's not ashamed to come back and uh, redeem us again and bring us back to a place where we should be. So he's talking this this, this evening, excuse me, in the book of Hosea, chapter 13, I would like to read two passages of Scripture. I'd like to read chapter 13 and verse 2, and then we will go over to chapter 14 and read verse 8. Chapter 13 and verse 2, he said, And now they sin more and more and have made molden images of their silver, and idols according to their own understanding. All of it the work of the craftsmen. They say of them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. Then in 
chapter 14 and verse 8, he says, Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. I want to talk to us just for a few minutes, and I won't keep you long tonight. I know that you're uh, getting around and trying to get everything ready to go back in life to somewhat normal. But I want to share a thought with you that I think is so important in the world we're living in today. Uh, it has to do with modern-day idols. Uh, you know, we, we don't uh, necessarily set up something and carve it out of stone or wood and set it up on the table and say, this is what we worship. But just because we don't carve it out or make it out of mold and uh, metal or, or pour it in concrete and paint it the way we want it doesn't mean that we we don't have the potential to raise things up in our life that can take the place of God because the Bible teaches us all throughout the word of the Lord that God is a jealous God and that we are his people and he wants to be our God and we need to understand today that when when we are his people and he is our God that there, there are things about us that could possibly raise up in our life and make us to where that uh, we could put something in the place of the Lord. But this passage from Hosea seems that it's harsh, and it seems like that, that God is, is really breaking down on them, and He's coming down hard on them. But it, it would seem that God is indifferent to man and, and the different needs that man has. But truly... It's a message of love and how that love that God has for His people will eventually triumph in the end. Because God's not going to give up on us. You know, there, we as humans, we have a... Uh, we say we love people unconditionally, but, but in all honesty, there's, there's a limit. And we have a, a certain amount that we will go and how far we will go. And, and, and we just finally put our hands up and wash our hands of it and say that's all that we're going to do. But, but there comes a place where we have to say that if we're going to be like God, we have to just be able to love like He does. And, and thankfully, He just loves endlessly and, and, and He has enough faith in us and enough faith in Him that His love will triumph in the end. In the first passage that we read to you, it uses the phrase that they made idols according to their own understanding. They made idols and they made them to their own understanding. This is a religious action that follows the departure of God. For there is something about it, when we, we look at, uh, there's something about us that we, and we'll cover here in a little bit later, but how that God uh, made us with a desire to worship something. And He reveals Himself to us and He wants us to worship Him. But when we don't worship Him, we will raise up something else to take that place because that's just what we need. We, we need that. So it's a religious action, this raising up idols according to their understanding. It's a religious action that follows the departure from God. And when we look at idols, we have to consider three things. We have to consider the cause. Why do we do that? We have to uh, realize the course of it, what we do to do that, and then we have to realize the curse that comes when we raise up idols. So real quickly tonight, we'll get into this. What's the cause of idolatry? What causes that? Why, why has men throughout history made idols for themselves? Why have they done that? Because idols are a false answer to the religious call of the human nature that God put in us. This cause is, uh, is, is found in the ways uh, when we have a clouded view of God. Humanity is created with that, as we already mentioned, with that uh, in, inherent desire for God. There's something about us that wants God. And every man has his God. We either have the real God, the right God, or we substitute something else, whether we, regardless of what it is. We, 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 we do it according to our own understanding. What, if, if we don't have the knowledge and the understanding of the one true God, then what we do is we create our own God. As it said in the book of Hosea, they did it in their own understanding. In other words, what they thought that He would be. And, and every human being is the... Uh is going through their motion. They're, they're, they, are, they are using their force of life to do something. Everybody has a passion. Everybody has a passion. 
Everybody, every life has a ruling passion. There's something that drives them. There's something that, that pushes them. And, and uh, uh, one passion will be dominant in our life. Everybody that's ever uh, lived has a passion, a passion for something. And one passion that we have will dominate our life. And the ruling passion is the secret to life. What do we let rule us? What is our number one passion? What, what drives us? And, 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 and what drives us and what motivates us? What causes us? And in other words, and uh, I've, always, I've always liked sports and you know that, but when you look at a sports person, uh, I've, heard of, I've heard of athletes who when they were young and they were growing up, they, if they were a football player, they, or, uh, they, they carried the football with them every place they went. They slept with the football. They, they talked football. They ate football. They just, everything about them was football, football, football. If it interfered with football, then they got rid of it because that football, that, that love for that sport was passion. Some people have it with, with politics. Some people, that's all they want to talk about. That's all they want to be a part of. Some people have it for uh, business and all of these things they have to do that. And, and what we have as a ruling passion will dominate our life. And that's was the cause, that was the cause for Israel and Canaan to get into idol worship is because that, that strong desire to worship something was there and they, they lost their understanding of the one true God, and so they drifted into setting up things of their own understanding. You know, uh, people's understanding takes us to the second part of this, the course of it. They had idols. They needed to worship something. They had to have a passion. They had to have something to love and something to devote themselves to. So what did they do then? That was the next thing is the course of it. They, they had idols. Or, or, or how did they do this? They did it. They, they set up an idol. We're going to worship something. So what, how are we going to, what are we going to worship? We're going to have to worship something that is according to our understanding. Something that, that we think. Something that we conceive. Something that we, that we know is there. When men... Uh, lose their vision of God, they construct our own, or they construct one of their own. They construct a God of their own, and they do it according to their own understanding because they, they try to evolve in their own thinking what God is. What is God? You can take a hundred people who don't know God, and, and you could uh, uh, have them describe, what, what do you think God is? And, and, and we, hear it, uh, we hear it today. Uh, this were the terms like the God I know, the God I believe in, the God I serve, the God will, will not do this or will not do that. I heard recently a, a professional athlete who will probably someday be a, a first ballot Hall of Fame football player, uh, he made the statement that he, he left Christianity because of the fact that he said, I could not conceive of a God who would not like this or not like that. So he said, if I can't conceive of a God who would like this or not like this, he said, I can't serve that kind of God. That's what he was doing. He was, he is, he was trying to evolve in his mind his own understanding of what God was, and so therefore he was going to worship a God of his own understanding. In Solomon's day, idolatry took two forms. When Solomon died, first of all, when Solomon died, the kingdom was split because of his sin, because of his lifestyle, and it became a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, and Jeroboam was the ruler of the northern kingdom, and he set up a new center of worship. And he did this for political purposes because this is what the people wanted. So he set it up, and, and you, we won't take the time tonight to go over this, but he did not deny Jehovah God. He did not deny the one true God, but he made it a likeness unto his understanding. He said, there is a God, but he said, this is how I feel like God should be. And he did it in his own understanding. And this is the meaning of the calves in our text. It was a false representation of God. They said, everybody here, we're gonna, we, we want to worship God, so we're going to make it, we're going to make God into this image that looks like a calf. He wasn't denying it was God. He was just saying, this is what we understand God to look like. And they would come and they would worship at that God and they would kiss that, that calf in their attempt to worship God. Now in the days of Ahab, they were, uh, they were not worshiping what they thought to represent God, but they began to substitute other gods for God. 
and idols according to their own understanding. And the curse of the idols was that when man makes idols, they, they make them like unto themselves. That's what we want. And uh, it results, the results of that are, are disastrous. I want to read a, uh, a scripture for you today from the, for tonight from the book of Psalms, Psalms 115. This is what David was saying. Now, 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 now think about this in light of what we've been talking about. Psalms 115 verse 1 says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? He says, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. In other words, he says, The heathen says, Where's your gods? He said, Our God's in heaven, and our God does what he pleases. He does whatever he wants. And he says, their, now notice this, this is interesting. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have made their gods after their own understanding. They shaped them with their own hands and made them that way. He says, their gods, their idols, they have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. Now verse 8 says, They that make them are like unto them, so is every one that trusteth in them. In other words, what he was saying, he said, they have all these gods who, who, who they've made, and they've made them like themselves. They've made them like themselves. This reveals... Uh, the vision cycle, the vicious cycle, that men make idols like themselves. Because, and when you make an idol like yourself, it's imperfect, it's polluted, it's debased. And they become like the idols that they create. And they become empty and they worship these things and it leaves them empty. They worship the sports, they worship the politics, they worship the money, they worship the prestige. And then when it's all over with, they find themselves still empty because in their own understanding, this is what it takes. But the hope of this is found in our second text in Hosea where the writer is talking and he says in chapter 14 and verse 8 he says Ephraim shall say what have I to do any more with idols I have heard him and observed him I am like a green fir tree from me thy fruit is found the hope of this is when is the hope of turning from our sins and, and putting things before God. You know, we don't have, we don't have a, a statue. I don't have a statue in my home where I can, or, uh, an idol room where I go in and I worship those things. But, uh, but an idol is anything I put before God. And I try to reason it and understand it and say God won't care and God don't mind and, and God doesn't, doesn't object to all of these type of things. But, but really He does. And my only hope is when I become like the scripture says, what have I to do any more with those things? You see, God doesn't want me to just do away with my job because he's told me that if I don't provide for my family, that, that I'm worse than an infidel. I have certain responsibilities. He tells me that I have to do these things to be a good steward, and he wants me to be a good steward. But the key is, we've just got to learn to put some things in proper perspective. That if what we do for our entertainment, what we do for our occupation, what we do for anything else in life, whatever else gives us joy, if we put that as a higher priority than God, then we've made an idol out of it. You see, David talked about, David talked about they have made them out of silver and gold and you read through the, the word of the Lord and they, they've taken trees and idols and carved them and done all kinds of things. But we may not do that. But what have we put ahead of God? What has become a higher priority in our life than the word of God who, which is forever settled in heaven? What is forever settled in heaven we have put things that will rust and, and mold and a, and a thief will break in and steal as a higher priority in our minds and in our lives in God. You see, God wants us today to be just like he did 
like he wanted his people back in, in Hosea's time to just put their relationship with God as the highest priority. God doesn't care if I have a house or a car or a job. He's given me those things and he's blessed me with those things. But they'll only stay a blessing if I put them in proper perspective. And so this evening, the whole essence of this Bible study is we can't afford to have a higher desire in our life than to live pleasing to God. Does God want me to have fun? Yeah, God wants me to have fun. Does God want me to work? Yes, He wants me to work. Does God want me to enjoy the things of life? Yes, He does. He, he, he doesn't mind that at all. No place, no place in the Bible does it tell us that God wants us to live a, a life of miserableness, but He wants us to enjoy those things. But what He is saying is, put Him first. Love Him. Love Him with all of your soul, mind, and strength. Love Him. Put Him first. He said, I have heard Him and I have observed Him. That's, that's how... That's, that's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to hear Him and to observe Him and to become like Him and not like what our understanding of Him will be. Then He will say like He did in verse 4, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. Mine anger is turned away from Him. He will heal their backsliding. In other words, He will, he will heal our departing from God's ways and bring us back. Let's evaluate where we are in God. You know, it's been uh, about six weeks or so since we've been able to have church. It's been about six weeks. And uh, to be honest about it, there's been zero accountability. You've not had to see anybody. Nobody has seen you. You've been able to do whatever you want to do, and there's nobody going to know. You can watch what you want, look what you want, read what you want, and nobody's going to know. But if pleasing God is your number one passion, you will make sure that even in the secret times of your life, you're still going to do what's right. You're not going to elevate an idol. You're not going to elevate up something higher than Him because He's our number one priority. I'm going to pray for you right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to come into these homes again. And we pray, God, that you will stir our hearts Stir our hearts to make sure that the driving passion in our life is to please you. I know, God, that we have to do things. We have to work. We have to have family. And I understand those things. And for your word teaches us how to conduct ourselves as employers and as employees and as families. And, and, and it teaches us that it's okay to laugh because laughter is like a good medicine and that, we're, that our children are to bring us joy and our families are to bring us joy and your blessings are to be heaped upon us and, and we're to work and do those type of things, God. But let us make sure that we put none of that above our desire to be pleasing to you, our desire to be pleasing to you. And I ask you, God, that as we prepare to get back to normal church, if it'll ever be normal again, we don't know. But as we get ready to open our doors in another week or so, God, I ask you, Lord, to bless every family in this church and help us to get our eyes on you, that it's not how we understand it, but, God, that it's how your word says that's why you told us in all of our gettings to make sure we got understanding and not to lean on our own understanding, but to trust you for everything. In Jesus' name, we pray your blessings upon everyone that's watching or listening to this today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll just stay tuned for just a minute, we'll have our contact information up. Uh, Brother Pat Daniel will be putting it on the screen for you right now. And just stay there. And if you need to contact us by phone or by correspondence through the mail, He'll t that'll take care of it. God bless you. We'll be in touch with you soon, and we'll see you Sunday morning uh, back on this form of message in, as we get ready to go to back to live church. God bless you.